Good morning, continuing in Bereshus chapter 3, verse 22, with Revi, the fourth portion. We learned yesterday about the punishments which God meted out, dished out to the serpent, to the woman, and to the man because of the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge and everything that represented. So the concern is, now that man knows good and evil, <clears throat> and man has free choice and he can choose evil, God forbid he should live forever. And therefore it's imperative that he does not eat from the tree of life, which would give him eternal life. So Hashem, God said, Man has now become like one of us a respectful way of saying, like God, to know good and evil, and now the concern is, <clears throat> lest he extend his hand, and take, not only from the tree of good and evil, which I told him not to take from, and he took. And now he knows good and evil, but Gam also may eat from the tree of life. And he eats that, he will live forever. He is unique amongst the beings on earth, just as I am unique amongst the heavenly beings. What is unique? <clears throat> what's unique about Hashem and what's unique about man? Knowing good and evil. Not so, all animals and all beasts, they don't know good and evil. Animals, beasts, heavenly creatures, all of God's creations do what God expects of them. They have no choice. And now, says Hashem, And if he lives forever, Then, he will be likely to cause people to be fooled, and to tell people, Af, who Elika, that he's also a God. How many people do we have who didn't live forever who said, I am God? And then they died. Thank God. Imagine if they live forever, then we really got trouble. Yesh, Midrash, Agoda, there are many Agadic interpretations here. But they're not in harmony with the plain meaning. And as we learned yesterday, Rashi says, I primarily come here to teach the simple meaning. If I quote a medrash, it's only because the medrash is pertinent to the simple meaning. Otherwise, says Rashi, I could be quoting medrashim all day. That's not Rashi's function. Just to briefly bring out a very important point. When we study Bible stories although they are the most profound arena of Torah, nevertheless, they seem somewhat childlike. Bible stories. I have to remove, evict Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden because if they eat from the tree of life, they're going to live forever, and that's going to be a problem, so i got to make sure that they don't eat from the tree of life. If you're God, even if they eat from the tree of life, they shouldn't live forever. What's the big deal? They do eat, they don't eat. What is this, a fairy tale? And again, without going into a lot of uh, explanation, in short, that's exactly what he's saying. Eating from the tree of life means connecting to the blessing of eternal life. I have to make sure that man does not connect to the blessing of eternal life. I have to take away that blessing of eternal life. What does it mean to take away the potential blessing of eternal life? It means to remove him from the source of eternal life. What is the source of eternal life? The Eitz Hachayim, the creation of God, which is the source of eternal life. So although we talk about a tree and we talk about a garden, and it's all true, but the tree and the garden are symbolic of the source of God's eternal life. So it's all the same but in order that even children should understand it. It comes in the form of a tree and a garden and removing, and but all that's true, but representing a much greater depth. That's Bikitsur. 
23, And Hashem got, sent him out, evicted him from Gan Eden, to till the ground, from which he was taken. Man is from the earth. So God evicted him from Gan Eden. Gan Eden was a place of holiday. It was a place of vacation. It was a retirement home. You could just sit in Gan Eden and enjoy. Hashem removed Odom and Chava from Gan Eden, and they had to now go to work. Boker Tov. Mi Gan Eden, mi ke, uh, Okay, verse 24. Vayegoresh esa Odom, and he threw out man. Vayashkem mi Kedem le Gan Eden, and he dwelled east of Gan Eden. And he placed there, rather. Vayashken means, and he, Hashem, placed on the eastern entry to Gan Eden, es hakruvim, a creation called kruvim, as Rashi defines what does kruvim mean here. We're familiar with the word kruvim because the cherubim, the kruvim, sit on top of the ark. But here, this is a different kind of kruvim, angels of destruction. So these were guards who were guarding the entry to the Garden of Eden to make sure that Odom and Chava do not re-enter. So he placed the Kiruvim, as Rashi says, the Malachi Chabola, the angels of destruction. And in case the angels fall asleep on the job, he has a second situation there. Veis laha tacherava misapeches, and a flaming, revolving sword Lishmer as derech eitz to guard the pathway to the tree of life. So there's no way that Adam and Eve could make it past the angels of destruction and past the revolving sword to get to the tree of life. Twenty-four mikedem legan eden b'mizrachay shel gan eden east of gan eden chutz lagon outside the garden. Es hakruvim malachi chabola angels of destruction. Hacherev amisapeches. It had a flashy flame to frighten man with the conus eight lagon that he no longer ever re entered the garden. Targum lahat shnan, it means a blade. Kame shlaf shnona, or blashain laz lama. O medish agoda yes, there are many medroshim, bani eni bo ela lepshute. I have only come to interpret the simple meaning. And this is the closest that I'm going to bring down from Medrash because it is close to the simple meaning. Just to very briefly quote a teaching, I believe, <clears throat> I heard this teaching from Rabbi Yossi Jacobson. I'm sure he didn't make it up. He called it from somewhere. That we find there are two places in the Torah where the Torah uses the word kruvim. One is here. And one is, as I mentioned earlier, on the ark, on the holy ark there, Kruvim. The Kruvim have the faces of babies, winged babies. That's what it says. You see the, the recreations of the tabernacle. The Kruvim has a baby's face with wings. So he says that when children are born and we have to raise them, it all depends how we raise them. If we raise them in a proper way, then they end up sitting on the ark and they are holy kerubim, engaged and immersed in Torah. If we don't raise them in an appropriate way, they could become angels of destruction. It's all about what you do with the kerubim. They're the same kerubim. But if they are properly taught and properly raised and properly brought up, they could be sitting on top of the holy ark and be the center of the Shekhinah, or if they're improperly brought up and improperly taught and improperly raised, they could be raised to be angels of destruction. They could be running around doing random killings, God forbid. So that is a teaching of how important education and appropriate education and Torah education is. Chapter 4. <clears throat> this is perhaps the earliest example of the rule, which is brought down again and again, of Ein Mugdam or Mu'uchar Batorah. There's no necessary chronological order in the Torah because we learned that 
Adam and Eve, Odom and Chava, had already been evicted from the Garden of Eden, yet we go back in time and we read a story that happened while they were still in the Garden of Eden. As Rashi explains, this happened earlier. So if it happened earlier, why isn't it brought down earlier? The answer is because a mugdam umu'uchar b'Torah, because the Torah is not a history book. It doesn't have to follow chronology. It has to follow teachings. And obviously this belongs here. Chapter 4, verse 1. V'ha'odam yoda es chava ishtoi. And Odom knew his wife Chava. And the idea of knowing means he was intimate with her. When we study Kabbalah, we say that the idea of Das is knowledge, is connection. And this is the source, that knowledge is connection. V'ha'odam yoda es chava ishtoi. V'atahar, and she conceived. And back <clears throat> in the Garden of Eden, all of this happened very quickly. It didn't take nine months. It took maybe nine minutes. Vateled as Cain, and she bore her oldest son, Cain, Cain. Vatemer, and she said, wow, this is amazing, she said. Look, a baby. Konisi ish es Hashem. I have acquired a person in partnership with Hashem. This is wonderful. Rashi 1, Viha Odom Yoda, Kvar Shamaila. This took place before the story we learned above. Kedem Shachota, before Adam sinned, Venitud Migan Eden, and was banished from the Garden of Eden. Vechain, not only did the story of Adam being intimate with his wife, Sarah, uh, Chava rather, the conception and the birth, all of that took place before the eviction. Because if it had just written Vayeda Adam, Nishma, one would think, that this happened afterwards. Therefore, he says it in the expression of Adam Yoda. Earlier yet, Adam knew his wife, Chava. Cain, the name Cain or Cain, comes from, <clears throat> I'll shame the name, the word, Konisi, I have acquired. Good morning. Es Hashem, Kimayim Hashem, with Hashem. Meaning, what was Chava's message? Kishabora Aisi, when God created me, V.S. Ishi and my husband, who Levade Bro'anu, God himself created us. Nobody helped God. But here, here there are three partners. And he quotes here, the root source of this teaching is in tractate Nida Lamed Aleph, where it says, that every human being has three partners, father, mother, and Hashem. So that realization came upon Chava when she named him Kain, Konisi Ish, Im Hashem. Or es Hashem. Now Rashi brings down a famous medrash from Bracious Rabbo, Es Kain, Es Ochiv, Es Hovel. <clears throat> In verse 2, he talks about the fact that Kain was not the only one born. There was also Hevel or Hovel, another brother. And then it says the word Es three times. The, the verbiage would have run just as smoothly had it not said the word S three times. It could have said, Vateled Kayin, Vatosef Loledes, Ochiv Hovel. Why do we need the three S's? So Rashi brings down from the Medrash, and this answers a big question. It's very nice that Adam and Eve had Kayin and Hovel, but who did they marry? Who did Cain and Abel marry? How did they have children? In order to have children, you need a wife. So he says, Rashi brings down from the Medrash, Medrash Rabba, Gimel, Eisim, Ribuyim, Heim. The fact that the Torah brings down S three times, this is an amplification. Melamed, it teaches us that there's another teaching concealed here. That along with Cain came a twin sister. That along with Cain, a twin was born, a twin sister. Vi'im Hevel, and by Hevel it says S twice. 
S Achiv, S Hevel, Neil Dushtayim, two twin sisters were born. Lakach Nemar, Vatasev, therefore it says that Vatasev. So now we have Kayin having a twin sister and Hevel having two twin sisters. So Kayin marries his twin sister. Hevel marries his twin sister. And one of the reasons that Hevel and Kayin were killing each other <laughs> is they were fighting over the extra twin. Who's going to get the girl? Verse 2. Vatesif Loledes, and she additionally bore as Ochiv as Havel, his brother Havel. Vayehi Havel Reyetzain. So Havel grew up to be a shepherd of sheep. That was his vocation. He was a shepherd. Vekayin Hoya Eved Adama. But Kayin was a farmer. Reyetzain. Why was he a shepherd of sheep? Lafish and his Adama, because through his father Adam, the earth was cursed. So he says, who needs to work the earth and struggle, and it'll give forth thorns and thistles? Let me raise sheep. Porash lay me he withdrew from working the earth. Verse 3 Vayahimi Kates Yamim, as time went on. Kayin brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to Hashem. Kayin was a farmer and he worked the earth. So he brought a fruit, to, he brought a gift, a korban, an offering to Hashem. Now, Kayin was a tough businessman. And Kayin said, What should I give Hashem? I should give Hashem the worst, I should give him all the rotten stuff. All the stuff that I can't use anyway. Like my father of blessed memory used to get very upset when he used to talk about the people who go up to their attic and they give their old ripped torn clothing to charity. He says, and this is what the kids see. The kids see that this is what you give to charity. That which you can't use anymore and before it clogs up the attic, you better give it to charity. That's, it doesn't mean you shouldn't give old clothes to charity. It means you should also give big checks to charity. And that's what the children should see. So Cain, he stuck with the old clothes. Min ha he gave the worst. And there was a medrash that said that he gave flaxseed. And uh, there are many interpretations as to the symbolism of flaxseed. One of them is, is that when flaxseed grows, the same, uh, what is it, a branch or whatever it is that upon which it grows doesn't produce more flaxseed but it has to just regrow from the beginning so it doesn't sort of regenerate and renew. I'm not sure if I know exactly what I'm saying because I'm not much of a farmer, but this is the idea. Others say that the, the flax is the opposite of the wool. That's the idea of the, uh, uh, of, of the cloyim, that you're not allowed to wear wool and linen. So he saw Hevel dealing with wool. He brought the opposite. I mean, why didn't he bring watermelons? He was the farmer. He had everything. He could have brought tomatoes. He, choo- he chose flax for a reason. Verse 4. But Hevel, he also brought a gift. What did he bring of the best, of the firstborn of his sheep, of their fat? He brought the gift, the first fruit, the best fruit. By Yisha Hashem and Hashem turned El Hevel, Vel Minchose, to Hevel and to his gift. Ignoring Cain and his gift. Vayisha, Vayifan, he turned. Vechain vel minchasi leisho, leifona, vechain vel yisha leifna, vechain she'e meolop, pnei meolop. So Rashi shows that the word Vayisha means he turned. How did God turn? Vayisha, yorda esha, flame came down, velichacha minchasi, and licked up his offering, and Cain's offering sat there lonely. So this caused jealousy. And again, as we look into the commentaries, Hevel was a spiritual giving person. He was a charitable person. He was a godly person. Cain was only thinking about himself and his own level of profit margins. And he was only interested to make sure that he has more than 
Hevel. That was the whole competition. There was Cain and there was Hevel. Verse five, five, did we learn five? Vel Cain, vel to Cain and to his offering, Hashem did not turn. Vayichal Cain ma'ed, and Cain became very upset. Vayiploponov, and his face fell, and he went on to Prozac. Vayemer Hashem al Cain, and Hashem said to Cain, Lo machor alach, why are you so upset? Velo manof lufanecha, why is your face fallen? Don't be a victim. Don't walk around saying, poor me. You know how the old kid song goes? Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms. You know, don't, don't, don't say nobody. It's all about you. Take control. says, If you become better, then you'll be uplifted. It's up to you. Make the right choice. But if you don't improve your ways, how's that go? You've got to change your less. But if you don't improve your ways, then your sin will always be sitting at the door. If you don't repent, your sin will wait for you till the door of death. And unto you is the desire of the sin, which means that I know, says God, that as a human being, you love to sin. Humans are drawn to sin, but don't think the sin controls you. The ato tim shoba, you can control the sin. And this is one of the most philosophically powerful verses in the Torah, where in one verse, God wraps up the story of the human condition. You have free choice. You need to take control of your life. Don't blame everybody else. Don't become a victim. Yes, I know that you have this powerful urge to sin. You also have the capacity to control that powerful urge. End the verse. And that's the whole thing is like in 15 words. Seven. Halei imtetiv kitagume per Rashi says, I prefer the interpretation of the Talmud, because there are other interpretations. If you will better yourself, you'll be forgiven. If not, la Pesach hatas revitz, la Pesach kivrecha chet acha shomer. At the entrance of your grave, your sin will be waiting for you. It's like you get on an airplane, you're going international, and as you're about to get on the airplane, they say, did you order duty free? <laughs> Here's your duty free. <laughs> it's waiting for you there. He says, uh, after 120 years, you, oh, <laughs> here's your sin. But the tshuva removes that. The repentance undoes the sin. Your desire for the sin is within you. What does that mean? What's within us that desires sin? Who There's an evil inclination, a little voice within each and every one of us. Tomit continuously shaking, desiring, and craving, to cause you to fall, to stumble. Nevertheless, it does not control you. You can control it. You can rule over it if you want to. You can prevail over the evil inclination. It does not have to control you. And that is the statement that God Almighty makes to Cain, Putting him on notice. Did it help? We'll see in verse 8. So Cain said to his brother Hevel, good morning. What does it mean he said? He entered into conversation with him. Cain said to Hevel, hey, why don't you come into Coffee Bean? Let's have some coffee. Getting him into conversation. And when they were out in the field, and Hebel was unsuspecting by Yaakov Kayin. Kayin got up. He rose up. El Hebel Achiv over Hebel, his brother, by Yageyu, and he killed him. And that was a great accomplishment because he had no idea how to kill because no one had ever been killed before. He didn't even see the movies. 
There weren't even any movies. This was pre-Hollywood, believe it or not. He entered into conversation with him, which led to an argument and shouting, to seek a pretext against him, to kill him. Again, Rashi says, again and again, if you have time, says Rashi, go to the Medrash. There are a lot of Medrashic, Agadic interpretations. But this is the simple meaning, and this is what I'm quoting. Whenever Rashi does that, it means that Rashi says, I am not going to quote any particular medrash because I'm okay with the simple meaning the way I'm telling it to you. However, even in the simple world, you should have a look at the medrash because there's a lot of good stuff there. But not quoting a particular medrash. Verse 9, Vayemen Hashem al Kayin. So Hashem says to Kayin, after he killed Hevel, he says, Hey, have you seen your brother Hevel? Hey, Hevel Achicha, where is Hevel, your brother? And here is a very famous phrase. By Yemer and Kayin said, Lo Yodati, I have no idea. Beats me. And he said the three famous words, Hashomer Achi Anochi, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> you lying murderer. <laughs> you murdered him. Am I my brother's keeper? Hashomer achi anochi. Verse 9, A hevel achicha, why does God, who knows everything, ask Cain, where is your brother Hevel? God knew very well where Hevel was. He was dead. Likonis ime bidivrin achas. To allow him to enter into words of gentle, to enter into conversation with him. Ula yoshuf, perhaps he would regret and repent. And the first step is, he would say, I have killed him. And I'm here to tell you that I've sinned and guide me to tshuva. None of that happened. Instead, very often when a person goes in a way of sin, what's the first step? Denial. He thought he could really fool God. Whenever it says ha, the beginning of a word, it's interrogatory, question mark. And he said, what have you done? Killed the voice of the blood of your brother. Tseyaki may lie, cries out to me, mino adama, from the, from the earth. Dmei achicha, says Rashi, not only his blood, dame, but vidam zariyes, of the blood of all his potential descendants. Millions and millions and billions of people would have come forth from Cain. The fact that you killed him from Hevel, thank you, prevented that. Davarachar, another interpretation, she also by Psoyim Harbe. He made many wounds. Cain inflicted many wounds upon Hevel. Because he had no idea what is the final blow, what kills someone. So he was all cut up. But the fact is, he finally figured it out and he finally killed him. So he says now in 11, the Atta, and now, Orur Otta, cursed. You shall be min ha'adoma from the ground, more than the ground was cursed. Asher potzo espia, which has opened up her mouth, lakachas to receive, as demei achicha your brother's blood, miyadecha from your hand. Orata min ha'adoma, yeisim imashin eskal lohi, more than it has been cursed, kvar ba'avena, with its sin. Vegam bezo heisipa lachtei, and even here, it has continued to sin to open up the earth and take the blood. And I am adding a curse concerning you that you and the earth will not get along. You're not going to be able to sit and farm and make a living. You're going to be a wanderer, a homeless guy. You're going to live under the freeway. shall never yield its strength to you. Twelve, kisave so adama, because when you 
continue to work the ground. What does that mean? Cain was a farmer. When you're going to engage in your farming, you're not going to find success. Like taste, if taste kaychalach, it's not going to yield its strength to you. No, no, you're going to have to wander the earth. You have no permission to live in one place. You've got to keep moving. And this is the idea of galus, of exile. Once upon a time, there used to be great tzaddikim who used to go on the road for, with gal, for galut. It says, galut michaperet, that exile brings atonement. That if a person is constantly in exile, then that itself is a very difficult experience, and that brings tremendous atonement. And that was a form of the atonement of Cain. So this is Novanod. You ever hear there's a children's, uh, a grandmother takes a child, puts the child on her lap, and goes, Nad Naid, Nad Naid. That's from Novanod, Na Naid. So Cain says to Hashem, Is my sin too big for forgiveness? Did I do such a terrible thing? So I killed him. God say, bit me a question mark. You carry the heavens and the upper creations and the lower creations. You only get stuck with my sin. Everything else you have no problem with. You have no problem with Venus and Jupiter and Mars. Just my sin you can't handle. Not understanding what free choice is. Not understanding what sin is. 14. Behold, you have driven me away today from my farmland. And from you I will be hidden. Well, you see, and I will be a wanderer. In the land, and everyone who finds me will kill me because they have no idea who I was, who I am. And, and that was a prophetic statement because seven generations later, his great-great-great-grandson killed him, thinking that he was hunting with Dick Cheney. 15, that was a joke, by the way. 15, Hashem said to him, Lachain, therefore, kol heide kayin, anyone who kills kayin, shivasayim yukam, vengeance will be taken upon him sevenfold. So I guarantee you that until the time comes, no one will kill you. Vayosam Hashem lekayin eis, and God set a sign for Cain, the mark of Cain. You ever hear the mark of Cain? Levilti hakes eisei kol meitzei, so that Anyone who finds him should not kill him because they'll see God's mark upon him and they'll know that he has divine protection. Rashi, lochein kol kayin, ze'echad min This is one of those abbreviated verses, v'romzu, where they suggest, but they don't fully explain. Lochein kol kayin, loshen go'ora. This is a threat. God extends a threat. This shall be done to him. This and this shall be his punishment. But he doesn't spell it out. God says, I don't intend to take revenge from Cain now. At the end of seven generations, I'll take revenge. Because Lemech, who will be a descendant of Cain, will arise, we are you, and we'll kill him, as we're going to learn in a couple days. Save hamikra sh'om ha you come, and the end of the verse where he says, seven, he nikmas hevel mekayin, that's the, the vengeance of hevel to kayin. Limdonu, this teaches us, shetchilas mikra loshim gorehi, at the beginning of the verse is a threat, a warning, shleitei bria maziktoi, that no human being should harm him. O kayetzebe, here Rashi, Spend some time on the grammar. We'll go through this quickly. King David said something similar. He makes a general statement but doesn't spell it out. Rashi 
Pedash Yer Lerosh U Lesor. Okay, verse, that's an example of the grammatical usage. Vayosem Hashem Lekayin Eis. Chokak Loi Eis Mishmei B'Mitzchei. Hashem engraved on Kayin's forehead a letter of his holy name, which did not permit anyone to harm him. So it was a supernatural protection. The rest of the Rashi is par- parenthetical, so we'll skip it. 16. By Yetzei Kayin Milifnei Hashem, and Kayin went forth from the presence of Hashem. By Yeshebaretz Neid, and lived in the land of Nod, Kidmas Eden, east of Eden. He went out meekly, as if he was deceiving Hashem. In a place of exiles, where the exiles flee. That's where his father went into exile. When he was driven out of the Garden of Eden, we learned that Adam was there. In general, we find that the eastern region, Ruach Mizrachis, Shelters murderers, that the city of refuge in Transjordan was also to the east. Wherever he went, the earth trembled. And people said, Sudamayolov, turn away from him. He's the one that killed his brother. By the way, it's important to point out who were the people? The people are his descendants. But when you get to descendants of many, many, many generations, it becomes a whole population. Verse 17, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and she gave birth to Chanoch, and he was a Builder of cities, he was a developer. By Yikra Shemoir, and he named the city Kishem Benoich the same as his son. By Yikain Benoir, Yikra Shemoir, Lezech Benoich Hanoich. Eighteen, by Yivoled Lechanoich, and Chanoch fathered Es Irod. The Irod Yolad Es Mechuyol, or Mechuyol Yolad Es Mesushoel. So here we come to Lemmach. Sometimes he uses grammatically for a male, holy to beget. Sometimes it says to bear. Because the word bear means giving birth by a woman. And the act of getting offspring by a man. When he says hippel, a causative form, he talks about a woman giving birth, so-and-so caused his wife to give birth, she means the act of begetting by man, fathering. Uh, I guess that's it. So that's the end of the portion, and tomorrow <coughs> we learn the setup, and the next day we learn about the murder or, or the manslaying of Cain by his great-great-grandson. Okay.